given that I know exactly who everyone is in the audience, should I really do my talk or should we just communicate about, let's have a conversation? Um, it feels rather strange. Um, I guess my talks aren't controversial enough anymore. Maybe that's what it is because now, people used to show up because I say such controversial things or so they say. Um, well, you know, they, I guess they buried me in the schedule. Oh, this is not going to trip over that. Um, so uh, so uh, um, I was thinking about this because I'm in the South. Um, I grew up in Baltimore, and uh, it's kind of halfway between the South. It was, it's south of the Mason-Dixon, uh, south of the North. It's south of the Mason-Dixon line, uh, but it was on the side of the North during the war between the states. Uh, so um, I, people who live in the North think I grew up in the South, and people in the South think I grew up in the North, and that's always the way it's been for me. Um, and it, there is a certain Southern sensibility uh, that I see down here in New Orleans, very similar to what it's like in Baltimore. It has that kind of, of Southern charm to it in a lot of ways. And, uh, and my mother gave me some very, probably Southern advice that you should never, ever discuss religion or politics in polite company. You should never do that. Uh, you might guess, you might have already guessed that I was a rather rebellious uh, young man. Um, and so I think a lot of things that are important are always mired in very complicated politics. Because anytime there is an important issue, reasonable people will disagree. And that's what really creates a lot of politics, is when reasonable people have two different positions that are diametrically opposed. This happens all the time. I finally really started to understand GPL compliance when I understood this, that there are lots of people who reasonably disagree about the policy question of GPL itself. And because of that disagreement, a whole myriad of complex issues kind of fall right out of it. And a lot of it's based in personal beliefs. Uh, and, I, and nothing on this slide can I say is a, is a provable scientific fact. It's what I believe is right through various experiences I've had in my life. I believe everybody should have the right to copy, share, modify, and redistribute all their software. I believe it's a fundamental and alienable human right. In other words, I believe that universal software freedom is something we should work to achieve. It won't happen in my lifetime. Uh, it was a very depressing week when I finally realized at some point about 10 years ago that I would die in a world with proprietary software in it. And I probably will. I almost certainly will. Uh, but I believe that's what we should be working to towards. towards. I think that licenses should be used to maximize that software freedom. That I think it's the right thing to do to use the software license to try and get as much software freedom in the world as we can. It's a belief. That, in other words, means I believe in strong copyleft. And I think every developer does have a right to choose which free lo software license they want. Um, the, you'll find an essay I wrote uh, with Richard Stallman uh, 15, 14 years ago now, a long time ago, um, in response to some things Tim O'Reilly said about how the right to proprietarize software is important. I don't think people should have a right to proprietarize software. But I do think people should probably have a right to choose which soft free software among all the OSI approved, FSF approved licenses. They should be able to pick which one they like the best. I don't have any problem with people picking permissive licenses. They're okay. If you like a permissive license, that's free software. You should choose it. I prefer a copyleft license, as you might guess. And all of this is a, a set of moral beliefs. It's, it's, it's a moral code. It's not scientific fact. People who disagree with me also have a separate moral code that disagrees with me. But that's where sort of the, the political disagreement begins. There's a different set of beliefs. I think that that's the fundamental issue, that we disagree in the world about some moral beliefs regarding this issue of software freedom. And I think the debate of whether copyleft makes sense, whether we should have copyleft in the world. I don't think it's a, it's a debate that should be avoided. I think it's OK to have that debate. Um, on the other hand, I'm sick of having to constantly defend the idea of copyleft. I find myself almost constantly in the last three to five years having to defend why we should have copyleft at all. I didn't used to have to do that. There's always been the permissive versus copyleft debates going back to, I think I found the first one on Usenet in 1987. 1986, somewhere around there. But I think both types of projects have a right to exist and should exist. Conservancy, the organization that I spend my day job running, has both types of projects. We have plenty of permissively licensed projects. More than half of our projects are permissively licensed. But we also have copyleft projects. 
And our job as a fiscal sponsor organization for open source and free software projects is to do the things that our projects want to do. And if they've picked a license, they've picked a license because they believe in its policy decision, so I want to help the permissively licensed projects be permissively licensed projects in the world. And I want to help the copyleft projects be copyleft projects in the world. And we could have created the Apache Software Foundation, but it already existed. There is an organization you can go to if you only like permissive licensing and you never want copyleft. Conservancy is welcoming all comers. And if we didn't deal with compliance issues, if we didn't do GPL enforcement, we'd be doing a disservice to our projects that have come to us and said, please help us with that issue. Please help us with GPL enforcement. So uh, some, uh, there's multiple people in this room who actually know that It's a Wonderful Life is my favorite movie. A couple of years ago, I, I, uh, you know, I watch it every year, of course, uh, usually twice a year. I watch it, end up watching it twice in December at some point. And uh, there's this interesting exchange during the film uh, between, uh, uh, spoiler alert, uh, I don't know if I need to do a spoiler alert for a, a movie that came out in 1946, but I will anyway. So leave the room if you haven't seen It's a Wonderful Life and plan to see it. Uh, but George is this uh, guardian angel here of, uh, of, uh, of, our, of our, our illustrious George Bailey. By the way, I've often said I want to be the George Bailey of free software. That's my, my lifelong goal. But he has this, this discussion with Clarence because they go into this bar and, and Clarence is just saying, hey, I'm an angel. How's it going? And people think this is weird. And George is trying to tell him, don't, don't tell people you're an angel. You know, don't tell that. He's like, well, they don't believe, oh, they don't believe in angels here. Oh, okay, sorry. They don't believe in angels? No, 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 they believe in angels. Why would they be surprised to see one? And this is how I feel about copyleft, is people say, because there are people out there who say, oh yeah, I like copyleft. And I tell them I do copyleft enforcement, and they say, oh, that's horrible. Why do you do that? Well, if you believe in copyleft, why are you surprised that people have to uphold copyleft? It's not magic. I don't believe in angels, so if I saw an angel, I would be surprised. But if I believed in angels, why would I be surprised to see one? Why, why are people surprised to see copyleft enforcement if they say they support copyleft. Yet most people are. Many people are, not most, but many people are. Many people are, think this is the world's ending because copyleft's being enforced. And it's the position of most for-profit companies in the Linux space. They are opposed to nonprofit organizations doing enforcement of copyleft. I don't think it's logically consistent because many of those companies say they're supportive of copyleft. Some of them are against it, which then it's logically consistent. Um, I, the fact of the matter is they're acting in their own self-interest. That's what companies do. I put on a slide earlier uh, at, a, at, a, at a related conference that was here on site this week that, oh, they act in the interest of their shareholders and they're legally bound to do so. Somebody told me that wasn't quite right. So but the fact is they do generally act in their own corporate financial self-interest. And they even use GPL enforcement when it suits them. Uh, we've seen multiple cases of this, of companies that otherwise are not supportive of enforcing the GPL, but they use GPL enforcement on their own copyrights when it suits them. And uh, in fact, I had a very strange experience with a, very, uh, with a representative of a very large corporation uh, at this conference last year. And we walked around that marina in San Diego uh, where, uh, where, it was, where this conference was last year. And this representative turns to me and says, you don't understand. If you don't stop doing GPL enforcement on Linux and BusyBox and Samba, my company will stop using that software. And I said, you kind of flatter me that I, doing enforcement on three programs, can change the business strategy of some big company. Uh, I don't really see how that can be true. I, I'm, I, you, I'm not that important in the world, by far. Uh, and then as we get back and we're walking up the steps into the venue, he says, oh, but by the way, if you see any violations of our competitors, let us know, because we'll help you enforce there. This seems pretty hypocritical to me. Uh, uh, needless to say, even though I've found violations among his competitors, I haven't gotten in touch. Um, so here's why I talk about religion. So I went to, I, I used to be a Catholic, I'm an atheist now, uh, but uh, I went to a Catholic college, and uh, we, I took a class on Flannery O'Connor. And there's this interesting piece in, in her habit of being where she talks about debating uh, with Protestants uh, regarding the issue of transubstantiation. Uh, 
Karen may be the only person in the room who knows what transubstantiation is, so I might have to explain it. Catholics believe that the uh, Eucharist is literally the blood and body of Christ, like genetically. Um, it's a Catholic belief. Most Protestants don't share it. And this founding of Karen is having this arguing, argument with a Protestant, and, and, she, and the Protestant says, it's a beautiful symbol. That's what matters. It's a symbol. And Flannery says this. That's how I feel about the GPL. If it's just a symbol of, oh, we're going we're to support software freedom, so we've slapped the GPL on our code to say, let's support software freedom, but that's all you do with it. You don't actually try to make sure that people comply with the license and give people software freedom. Why bother with it at all? To hell with the GPL if that's all you're going to do with it. I think we might as well use the Apache license if we're not going to enforce the GPL when people violate it. An unenforced copyleft is functionally equivalent to a permissive license. Because the only time the copyleft parts matter is when somebody fails to comply. Voluntary compliance happens all the time in the permissive license communities. People voluntarily give upstream to Apache projects all day long. Beautiful contribution to our community. It's wonderful that they choose to do that. It's their choice. They're not required. People do the same for GPL projects. Lots of people, even if it weren't GPL, they would give upstream. But there are people who choose to proprietorize free software. When they do it with Apache licensed software, it's fully permitted. When they do it with GPL software, it's not. And when they do, we should do something about it. So it, it, why are you making me give this talk? Because you, most of the room knows this, and I feel very weird. Um, <laughs> particularly on this slide. This is the history of the busy box enforcement, briefly. OK, that's fine, that's fine. You've never seen this slide? I use this slide to Collab Summit. This is the, ex the rest of my slide deck from here on out is the exact slide deck from Collab Summit. That early stuff was the only new stuff, so now this is my Collab Summit talk. Ah, there you go. OK, OK, OK. So it just feels weird. I know you all so well. Um, <laughs> what's that? I'm more nervous giving this talk to, to this group than I would be if it was full, right? Because it, it, it's all these people who know me well, right? It's very bizarre. But I sit in the back of the room, and you guys, you guys fill rooms. I can't, I can't even get you know, you know, people who aren't personally have personal conversations with me today in this room. I've had personal conversations with each one of you today. Um, it's a little weird. OK. <laughs> so, I mean, you notice I'm more nervous than you've probably ever seen me giving a talk. I, I mean, really, it's weird. So, uh, so, so the history of BusyBox, which you all know, um, is, is Eric Anderson rewrote it from scratch, more or less, starting around 2001. Um, after it had been used in the Debian project for a while, because he realizes it can be used for embedded systems. And what happens is, over the next six or seven years, is it quickly becomes the standard for building embedded systems. You put Linux with BusyBox, and you can build an embedded system, operating system, very, very easily. You have every, basically everything you need for the operating system. It's the peanut butter and jelly, in my view, of operating systems, but it's almost always used out of compliance. Uh, with both the BusyBox license, GPL, and the Linux license. So for years, I did enforcement for the BusyBox project, as you all know. Uh, <laughs> and a little while ago, oh, this doesn't, the, the, the title doesn't make any sense because the, oh, no, it's, I, I was supposed to carry that picture over. So this, he says it's degrading, right? So I, I don't know. I think that it's okay for what we were doing in BusyBox enforcement, which was we, had the BusyBox developers lined up to do enforcement, and we would ask, and I've talked about this in my talks before, that under Section 4 of the GPL, when you lose your distribution rights to a program, you lose them forever, effectively, under version 2 of the GPL. And only the copyright holders can restore them. One of the things the BusyBox developers decided to do was say, we want, before we restore your rights for BusyBox, we want to see compliance on all the GPL programs in the embedded system. And of course, Linux was there, because it's the peanut butter and jelly of embedded systems that BusyBox and Linux go together. A number of people got upset about this. Um, and it, it, the people, the funny thing is, is, and I've talked about this in other talks, the, among the people who were upset about the situation after a while were the BusyBox developers themselves, because while they were asking for comprehensive compliance as part of what they wanted to require, over time, they kind of became a little upset that they were the poster childs. Um, the Linux project was annoyed as well. So 
Um, this whole thing happens, this big story. I have a link on the slide. You all read the, the John Corbett's LWN article, A Tempest in a Toy Box. And so as this is happening, um, this is where Dennis really starts, who's the current maintainer of business, I say, wait, you know, we're the poster child for GPL. And he says to me, more people, as I'm walking through Brussels before FOSDEM 2012, Dennis says to me, I, you know, more people know my project for GPL enforcement than for the technology, and, and it bothers me. Because um, I care about the GPL, but I want to be known for writing great code that happens to be GPL, not having a GPL project that's code, right? And so I said, that makes sense. And he convinced me, in the end, that we should have Linux developers involved. He was also sort of annoyed. He's like, why am I, why am I doing the enforcement work for Linux guys? Why don't Linux guys do the enforcement work themselves? Because they should be here with us. Why aren't they standing with us together? If they care about the GPL, they should stand with us. If they don't care about the GPL, in sort of a Flannery O'Connor sense, although he didn't literally say this, I'm thinking, tell with them if they don't care about the GPL, right? Why, 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 go, why go out on a limb for Linux? Um, so Dennis says, well, why don't you talk to the Linux people and people you know in the Linux community and, and start enforcing for them? Now, the thing Dennis didn't know when he says this to me is that various Linux developers, particularly Matthew Garrett, but plenty of other developers, have been asking me for years, why won't you enforce for me? I'm like, well, I don't really have a project for you. Busybox is a member of Conservancy, and Linux obviously is not a member of Conservancy. Um, so I don't know how to structure it. You know, I have to figure out how to structure it in the right way. And what we did is we sat down with our board of directors and our lawyers and said, can we structure a project that's just about compliance? That's what we did. That's what the GPL compliance project for Linux developers is. Um, and so, so what we did as part of that was we, we sort of got all the projects together who were GPL, and we talked to all of them and said, how do you feel about compliance? Do you want to be, are you, are, you, are you concerned about whether people violate the GPL? And pretty much all of them agreed, um, uh, basically all of them, uh, their GPL and LGPL had agreed, that we should get a source release that works from GPL violators if one of our projects is violated. And if the GPL is infringed, copyright's infringed, violating the GPL, we should get that. And what we came to was uh, basically agreements with all our projects, that Conservancy will do the work, we, uh, we collaborate with the copyright holders involved, we have a mailing list, and we talk every time there's a compliance matter, we talk about it and decide how we're going to proceed. Uh, now, it turns out, as we would expect, BusyBox and Linux are the mostly violated. Uh, Samba actually has a lot of violations on it as well. Uh, once we started doing compliance for Samba, we've had a number of different Samba matters. We've done one or two for other projects. We've had one for Inkscape once. We've done a few for, um, for Mercurial. There's been a few times when, when Mercurial's GPL has been violated. Um, and we just work together with the copyright holders. Any copyright holder can join. They sign an agreement with Conservancy. Uh, it has to be approved by the project's leadership committee. So, that, so we make sure that there's agreement among everybody that we're going to be doing that. Um, and then Linux developers can join as well. Now, I want to be very clear that Linux is not part of Conservancy in the way that BusyBox and Inkscape and Samba and Mercurial are part of Conservancy. It's just a very narrow project specifically tuned to those Linux developers who hold copyrights in the Linux kernel who want to enforce the GPL with us. And we have uh, uh, 16, I think, now with us uh, who are major copyright holders in Linux. And the, the most important thing when we talk to violators, and all of you know this because all of you know about this compliance activity, I don't understand why I'm giving this talk, but <laughs> it's really a collaboration with the party who violated. The goal is to talk with them and to get compliance. Um, now, the fact of the matter is, is that it, it's, it's so many of them, and I've, I've talked about this in my talks that you've all seen before, have insisted on confidentiality and said, We'll come into compliance, we'll, we'll do the right thing with GPL, but we don't want anybody to ever know we violated, because uh, it's too embarrassing. And I've been agreeing to those confidentiality agreements for years and years. I, ironically, I am probably under more NDAs than most of you. Now, not NDAs for generally useful technical information. So it's, I'm not under NDA for the source code, I'm under NDA for the details of who violated when and how they came into compliance, which is not the, the technical information. The technical information they released to source code on their websites. Um, but they always ask for this, and it really is frustrating because people question my methods, question my motives, question everything. I am a pariah in the world because I enforce the GPL all the time. I've lost jobs over it. 
Uh, I have been called names over it. <laughs> I mean, you, you name it, I've, I've taken it for the GPL. And, uh, and uh, it's very hard for me because I can't go out and say, well, look, look at this company. It came into compliance and they, they, were, they were glad and we work with them and so forth. Until recently, Samsung actually agreed to let us say publicly that we had worked with them and help them come into compliance, and they did an amazing job. And the amazing thing about what happened with Samsung is that not too long ago, 2008, I was a plaintiff in a lawsuit against Samsung over GPL violations in their TVs, which is public. And Samsung did an amazing job in that source release, and that's, that I can talk about because it's public. That source release generated a alternative firmware community for Samsung TVs called the Samigo community. It's on the internet. You can go and look at it. And they've literally taken the Samsung release, which, by the way, has some of the best GPL compliance release I've ever seen. They've modified it, and they've made it so you can put a DVR on the SD card and plug it into the Samsung TV. And now, you can't get that directly from Samsung, but they've actually shown how GPL compliance can make a community of developers making those Samsung devices more valuable than they were the day they shipped from Samsung, which only helps Samsung to have devices that people can hack and improve. And on this new situation, Samsung was very quick to respond, worked with us very well. They GPL'd the code that they were supposed to GPL. They put it out there. It's, it, I mean, compliance matters take a long time. And this was a complicated one. And within weeks, they had the source code up there. And they wanted to make a pu public notice and say, go ahead, tell everybody publicly what happened and that it worked out well. So I'm really appreciative of that. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about, which uh, this is going to be more of a revelation with more people in the room, but I pretty much talked about this issue with all of you at one point. <laughs> um, so I used to avoid this, this elephant in the room that we have, which is this question of, are modules a derivative work of Linux? And you know what I think. You, you, I've talked about it with all, the, all of you. Yeah, most of you, anyway. You, you know that I believe that they're almost always, and I've talked to plenty of lawyers, and I've had more conversations with Dan Ravisher about derivative works of copyright than, than anything. And we believe that it's pretty difficult to create a situation where a Linux module isn't a derivative work, the, Linux, the module with the kernel is not a derivative whole. Many corporate lawyers disagree. Karen can tell you the case law is very limited on this. We both sides believe they're correct, and there isn't a general rule. It's going to matter. The details are going to matter. Um, and oh, this cut off a little bit. Uh, and the people who are the political opponents of GPL enforcement say this is going to be, it says, the ground war of GPL. That that's where we're going to have this big fight. And we probably will, I think, at some day have to have this fight. Linux is licenses at a crossroads. There's no question in my mind. We're, we're at a crossroads now. There are lots and lots of copyright holders in Linux who believe the GPL means what it says, that they contribute under the terms of GPL version 2 only, that it says derivative works need to be licensed as a whole under this license, and that modules have to be free software. There are other copyright holders who disagree with that. There are copyright holders out there who have literally said to me, I wish Linux were LGPL'd. It should have been LGPL, they've said. It's not. That's why we had this disagreement. When I started this compliance uh, thing, um, it's hard to get Linux, uh, Linus to talk about licensed stuff. Karen must know this. He, he doesn't like to have those kinds of conversations. So I cornered him at the Google party in 2012, right after we'd announced this program, because I kind of felt I needed to get his blessing. And I said to him, Linus, you know I launched this compliance program for Linux developers. I wonder how you feel about it. And this is what he said to me. He said, I, I, you, you used to push copyright assignment. I hate copyright assignment. You know that. And the reason that I didn't want to do copyright assignment in Linux is because I felt, one of the reasons, he said, is I felt that every developer should make their own decisions about the GPL. And I want each developer to have their own copyright and make their own decisions. So I feel like I've got the blessing from Linus that I need to, to feel like I'm doing the right thing by the project leader. Lots of other major contributors are working with us. The question is what happens next. I don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, but whatever it is, I won't do any action myself without the support of the developers. Ultimately, Conservancy is an organization to serve our developers and do what they tell me to do. And my only veto power is if the IRS says it's wrong. That's the only veto power I have when I do actions through Conservancy. The rest of it, the developers tell me what to do. And I say, yes, it's OK with the IRS, or no, it's not. That's my job, really. Um, and 
I'm working with developers who have significant copyrights in Linux, so we have to figure out what happens next. So I left plenty of time for Q&A, expecting there'd be people here, a lot more people here who would want to like, give me a hard time. I don't think most of you probably want to give me a hard time. So why don't we have the discussion I proposed we have instead of my talk? <laughs> and I'll take my mic off, and we'll just like, have a conversation. <laughs>